A number of you went to see the beard. Yes. How many of you actually did go to see the beard? Oh, that's the beard. Get some sense of it. Okay. So it's not. Uh... Okay. Uh... You know, that's a very intriguing question because the answer to it's so long that we could spend um, most of the time just answering that one. Uh, I don't know whether everybody can hear or not, but I guess if they can't, they can arrange to. The the beard, uh, for the sake, did you, does everybody know what the beard is? Did you talk about it in class? Mm -hmm. The beard is a play in which there are two characters, uh, Billy the Kid and Gene Harlow. And the setting is eternity, and it, and the, and it's all and it's blue velvet, and the only stage set is a uh, uh, table and two chairs, and the table and two chairs are covered with fur, and uh, Billy the Kid is dressed in costume for uh, a 1880 costume western, and Jean Harlow is wearing a, a a blue dress and has a purse, and. Uh, uh, the, the set, the stage is in blackness, and then an orange light comes on Harlow and the kid who are sitting at the table. And Harlow looks up and she sees the kid. She's never seen him before. Obviously, they're from two different times and spaces. And she says, before you can pry any secrets from me, you must first find the real me. Which one will you pursue? The kid says, what makes you think I want to pry any secrets out of you? And she says, oh, because I'm so beautiful. And the kid says, yeah. You know, so it starts like that, and this, that little opening passage becomes a refrain that's repeated several times there at the beginning, which it, it's like brings this vibra this impossible vibration of these two people together into a more and more solid state. They're also the only other thing in the costume I didn't tell you about is they're wearing little beards made out of torn white tissue paper, just two little beards, and uh, the. The question was how uh, how I can't what sparked. what sparked the writing of it. Um, I was in an airplane on the way to Los Angeles, and I was looking at a copy of Ring magazine, which was a boxing magazine in those days, and I looked at a poster reproduced in the magazine and sort of classical uh, 50s and 60s American boxing poster. And a th that boxing poster showed the two opponents, a photograph of each of the opponents on each side of the poster. And it would say, like, uh, Ali versus Fraser, big fight, uh, Madison Square Garden, so on and so on. Very large poster like that. And uh, while I was looking at that poster on the airplane, I saw Billy the Kid and Gene Harlow on the poster. And I saw a whole new poster with Billy the Kid and Gene Harlow on it. And I saw the text of the uh, poster in Beast Language, or a language that I called Beast Language, which was an invented language for writing sound poetry, which has sounds like uh, gar, grar in it. And combinations of that language and uh, 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 a kind of imagistic language. So it would say, ro so that instead of saying uh, big fight, Madison Square Garden, it would say like grar, silver, silver, grar. Uh, and I, when I flew back from Los Angeles, I still had that poster in my mind, and I was taking a cab back from the airport, and I saw a boxing poster in, a, in the window of a liquor store, and I asked the cab to stop, and I went in, and I looked on the uh, boxing poster, and it said, Telegraph Press. So the next morning, I phoned, tele that was at night, the next morning, first thing in the morning, I phoned Telegraph Press, and I said, uh, I want you to make a poster for me. And they said, what kind of a poster? And I said, uh, a, a poem poster. And this voice at the other end said, oh, yeah, polo posters. We make polo posters. Bring it down. <laughs> so uh, I, 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 uh, took, I made a mock-up of the poster. I, it, apparently, in the discussion, he told me to make a mock-up. So I had the measurements of the poster, the size that, it, that the boxing poster would be. And I blocked in all the letters the right sizes. It has numerous type sizes on it. And I took out a picture of Billy the Kid and a picture of Gene Harlow that I wanted reproduced on the poster, and I took it down to him, and uh, I handed it to him. And it was a pretty bizarre-looking item. 
<laughs> and uh, oh, the oh, the only posters that they made were boxing posters, by the way, except for one other poster, which was a uh, bumper sticker for the Rolling Stones. Which surprised me. And I handed this to him, and the guy looked at it for a long time. His name was uh, uh, Les Jelinski. He looked at it for a long time. And he said, "I'm not going to do it." And I said, "Why?" This is 1965. I said, why? And he said, oh, he's a pretty old guy. He said, uh, all you young guys think you know what Jean Harlow looked like, but you don't really know. Look at that crummy photograph of her. It makes her neck look ugly. I'm not going to do the poster. I said, I'll get another picture of Jean Harlow. You're right. <coughs> so I went out, and I spent about three days getting another picture of Jean Harlow, one that, I, that would go with the kid, because there are only two extant photos of the kid that are, that are in public domain at the, at, e even today. So I had the photo of the kid I wanted. Lots of photos of Harlow. I found the photo of Harlow I wanted to use. I took it back down. He said, okay. He said, I'll, I'll call you in a few days. These posters are very interesting because they use old wooden block types that are almost like circus types. And uh, the, the, all, almost all of this type was a variation on Cooper typeface. So you had Cooper typeface running from this size down to little tiny letters like that. And the lead on this said, Love Lion, comma, Lioness. Like big battle between Love Lion and Love Lioness would be the way you would read this if it was a poster. That was a, one of the few parts of the text in English. And uh, his assistant phoned me uh, about three days later, said, uh, come on down, check the poster uh, before we run it. I went down and I checked it. It was beautiful. I said, run it. It's fantastic. And we checked out where the red was. It's a two-color poster on white, red and blue letters on white. And uh, he said, uh, I said, perfect, run it. We checked out where the red was going to be, where the blue was going to be. Perfect. Just I'll come down tomorrow and get it. We, I think. I asked him to run about 200, uh, maybe 300. And uh, I went home, and about an hour later, Jelinski called me again. And he said, you've got to come down here. I said, I was just down there. I'm very busy. I love it. It's great. Will you just run it? It's perfect. He said, no, you've got to come down. I won't run it if you don't come down and OK it while I'm here. So I went down, and uh, he started reading it out loud to me. He said, love lion, comma, lioness, right? I said, right. It says, gar thy ru grahir, right? Right. Ruer, right. Grar with four H's, right. And he read this all thing all the way through, and there's lots of H's in letters. And at one point, he was reading a, a, the word grar, where it had about four H's, and he says, grar, H, 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 right? I said, yeah. He turned to me and said, what is this shit, anyway? <laughs> 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 and uh, well, then, I, then I explained to him that it was a, a, a language that I'd invented to write poetry in, and that it was a kind of, uh, uh, there wasn't any conceptual art at this time, but I described it. I said, it's a poster for an event that takes place in eternity. There isn't really any event because it's happening in eternity. So the poster is kind of the event. And the text is a poem in an invented language. And he said, I had a friend in the WPA who wrote poetry. And I, he said, I can really understand it now. <laughs> uh, we Actually, we got to be very good friends, too. Uh, over a period of time, he did a lot of work for me, and we, we talked more about his friend who wrote poetry. And, I, and over a period of time, I brought in other poems of mine in Beast Language. He, he used to keep them on his desk as a conversation piece when people would come in. That I think he, when he wanted to toy with their minds, he'd throw my book out. You know, like very straight, working class people, he'd show them this book and say, I'm doing some work for this guy, and watch them go through these changes. At least that's what I suspect. Uh, so he, he ran the poster, and I picked up the poster. And then I took it to the liquor store, where I'd seen the original poster. And I said, "May I put, I said, can I put this in your window? And the guy just looked up and said, no. I said, why not? He said, I, I, I should get some comps if I'm going to put it in the window. I said, OK. So I went back down to Jelinski, and I said, uh, show me a boxing ticket, will you? And he, and he prints boxing tickets down there, too. So he gave me a boxing ticket, or else I, maybe I had a boxing ticket at home. Yeah, I did. I had a, a boxing ticket at home, and I wrote a boxing ticket in beast language. Then I had Jelinski print two comps 
to go with every uh, poster that was printed. And I went back and I said, here's your two tickets. Can I put this in the window now? And the guy said, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, actually that stayed in that window longer than any of the other posters I put up. Uh, that poster stayed there for months. It was, that was at the corner of Haight and uh, Masonic, as a matter of fact. I used to stand across the street and watch people go by and go back and stop and look at the poster or go by and not look at the poster and all, various people's reactions to that poster. It was an interesting place to, to have it because there was so much traffic there. Then I went around and I put the, I, I remember I stapled one over Kenneth Rexroth's front door and uh, I tacked another one to Kenneth Anger's front door and uh, then I put up a bunch of them at third and uh, mission and I put up a lot of them in the western edition and I folded them in half and stapled tickets to them and wrote friends' addresses on them and mailed a lot of them out. And I put one on my wall. At that time, I, my typewriter was, I sat at my typewriter in such a way that I faced uh, west into the, into the sun when it was setting. So on the east wall, behind my head, I put up one of the Love Lion Lioness posters. And I'd sit there typing, and as I was typing one day, I discovered that Billy the Kid and Gene Harlow, maybe the reflection, maybe the setting sun had reflected in their photos, and then it focused into my consciousness, because I had Billy the Kid and Gene Harlow in my head, in three dimensions, beginning to act out this right. And so I became the typist for their right. And I guess that's what sparked it. It's a good spark. Really? Well, uh, I, at the time, well, the beard would be like the, the wings of an angel, something to set you off from, I mean, e even in eternity, I guess. Something to set you off from immortal. So, something to set you off uh, as even further immortal. And then one day Robert Duncan, another Bay Area writer, uh, called my attention to the fact that uh, lady pharaohs wore false beards in Egypt uh, as, an, as a, a, a divine attribute, I suppose, or, or to show their divinity. And I wasn't aware of that at the time. But perhaps uh, unconsciously or for, from some other direction that was a part of it. Thank you. My daughter just told me that uh, they're doing it in an acting class at San Francisco State right now, and that uh, a brother of one of her girlfriends is playing Billy the Kid. And I believe it's being done in New York now at the New York Theater Ensemble. At least it was a few weeks ago. I don't know. Uh, Uh huh. Well, I'm not. You, you know, there's a lot of variation. Yeah. There's a lot of individuality and a lot of sets. I've seen it done everywhere, from just two, uh, two chairs and a table to pretty elaborate sets, where people got involved in it. Then another time, it was done in a boxing ring, which I thought was nice. Is it still no. I don't think so. No, it isn't. No, I didn't. My wife uh, and daughter went up to see it. They told me it was good. They told me they liked it. Uh, I was out of town. I remember seeing it originally. Where? At downtown at the Encore or no. down in the wharf at the wharf or in the California Hall on Polk Street? And you know, we also did it in the Fillmore Auditorium. Oh, yeah, with a light show. It was very beautiful. They used handheld microphones and the entire sound system. And of course, the play was considered pretty obscene verbally in those days, to say the least. And to hear the, you know, like all the uh, kind of divine scatology coming out of the Fillmore sound system was great. And Tony Martin did a light show that must have been about 30 by 70 feet behind it, incorporating films into the light show. It was the first time I'd seen that done. That was a great performance, too. Well, 
Probably it was 66. We first did it in December, we first did it, I think, on December 19th, 1965, or, or December 21st, 1965. And then uh, we did it until we were arrested. And then the ACLU protected us and they advised us not to perform it for a while. Or I guess that was after we'd been arrested a couple of times. They advised us not to perform it for a while. So probably you did see it in 66. Well, I uh, first wrote uh, a play in Beast Language. Before I wrote any poems in Beast Language, I wrote a play for 13 characters seated at a long table like, uh, with the character in the middle having lion's paws. Uh, sort of like a la it looked like the Last Supper. And all of them were bearded also. And as a matter of fact, they all, uh, in performance, it was performed, uh, I think, in 1959 or 1960. And uh, it must have been 1961. And all of the characters in it uh, made themselves big beards out of torn white tissue paper because we didn't have any budget. So that was the first uh, torn white tissue paper beards. Uh, they were supposed to be dressed in uh, uh, golden or cerulean robes. So we all rounded up Indian blankets, and they were all supposed to be bearded. So everybody tore different beard, sh uh, their own style of beard. And uh, the, the, uh, on the ends of the 13, the first and 13th persons were bearded women, and the second and 12th persons were uh, uh, Negro titans. And uh, we didn't know any black actors at the time. That was before the big black theater movement. So uh, a couple of my friends did that in blackface. And so here we were, like bearded women in tissue paper beards and guys in blackface and the guy with lion's paws in the middle. It's quite a beautiful play. And it was very successful. Uh, <laughs> very successful. <laughs> we invited about 100 people we knew who were our friends to come and see us. <laughs> And we thought we were great. <laughs> That's what I mean by very successful. But, and then, uh, maybe 59. Then in 1962, I began to hear those same sounds that were more or less born in the play in a ball of silence within myself. It's as if poem, beast language sounds were inhabiting this ball of silence. And I intuited that I was going to write a hundred poems in that language. And uh, that probably I wouldn't make any changes in the poems as I wrote them. That they would be spontaneous and that I would, as in the beard, I would be recording, although I hadn't written the beard yet, I would be recording sounds that were there. And uh, Again, with the beast language, there's, a kind of, there's an interesting organic side light for me. I, this can't be very interesting for you if you don't have a copy of the book to look at. But the, the first, there are 99, actually 100 of these beast language poems. And the first ones start out like baby talk. They start out like gree, gra, gee, gear, gwee, gwee, cut type of like baby talk beast language sounds. And the language matures as it develops and develops as an organism might develop into maturity and into a kind of blossoming, the language in the, in the long series of poems uh, develops as an organism would develop and reaches a maturity and then blossoms. So that around the middle, and also English goes in and out of these poems. For instance, like the 51st poem starts in English, probably has more English in it than any of the other beast language poems. I can think of one right in the middle, in the kind of like, uh, full maturity of this language. English comes back in briefly. And it's a kind of a night poem. It goes something like, uh, I love to think of the red-purple rose in the darkness cooled by the night. We are served by machines making satins of sounds. Each blot of sound is a bud or a star. Body eats bouquets of the ear's vista Gar, booty, eyes, ears, nose, deem thou, rur, vurna, garumi, nadrusirch, 
Nadi, the machines are too dull when we are lion poems that move and breathe. Juan, we grur, Andri, Maiktat, Sharu, Sri, Danodim, Des, Juan, Ethus, Ro. And you know, it's not impossibly far from Juan Dat Aprila with his Shura Sota, the throat of Merchath Persid to the Rota and bothered every vein in Swish Lakur, of which Bertu engendered is the Fleur. Than Zephyrus Ake with his sway to break, and spirit hath in every halt and hate, the tender Akrapas and the younger son hath in the Ram, his half a Kur is Arona. You know that? That was written about 1380. 1380? Yeah. That's part of the prologue to the Canterbury Tales, and so that, that's Middle English, which sounds exotic to us nowadays. Of course, it's got a nice rhyme scheme. There's a lot of uh, language coming into the beast poems, like Anglo-Saxon and Middle English and all that. Yeah. Were you, were you uh, was that going on with you? or? Not consciously. I wasn't exerting any conscious control. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of tantric language, and I think anything that uh, anything that uh, would create the tantras flew right into its being. Mm -hmm. And then, when many pe somebody will pick them up and read them as if they were a, some very Caucasian-looking individual will pick up ghost tantras, the beast language poems, and read them and sound like they're Japanese. Mm -hmm. And it's like some Japanese sub being of theirs suddenly decided to speak through them. Or perhaps somebody will be Dutch and pick them up and they'll sound Dutch. Um, they're interesting to read. If you see a copy of it, try reading them out loud yourself and see what they, see what your voice sounds like when you read them. Yeah. Uh, when I first wrote them, before they were even published in a book, we used to take them out at dinner time and pass the manuscript around. After, uh, after dinner, and uh, everybody would take turns reading them. It got to be kind of a party game. See, uh, you know, like which ones you'd open to spontaneously, and if you sounded like a Dutchman, or if you sounded Japanese, or if you sounded like an elf, or. <laughs> yeah. I did then. I did indeed then. I think I had some then. I was interested in that time in the way I saw lions looking at things. I felt that there was a particular consciousness there. Uh, I, think a, I think what I was seeing was the consciousness in a uh, completed carnivore. Uh, a, a, I, I saw several times in lions a kind of uh, lucidity of consciousness that up until that time I'd not seen in any other being. No, that's so long ago, David. No. Uh, do you mean the book of essays? No, I mean the theory. The oh. Idea. I don't know that there was a theory. Okay. Meat Science is a name that I gave to a book of essays. Uh -huh. uh, and it's a... Uh, it's the way I appreciate something. I'll say something is an act of meat science if I like it. Mm -hmm. If I feel that the totality of the person is in the act or the gestures that he's making. If, we, if you fulfill the whole sweep from uh, what we call mind to what we call body and, and, and do it with a wholeness, so that, like the whole mind-body is in it, then I see that kind of thing as being an act of meat science. If uh, if enough of the potentialities of a person are fulfilled within the possible potentialities of a series of actions, then I, then I think that really looks like an act of meat science to me. It's everything between uh, uh, Kuan Yin and Shiva. It's everything between the goddess of mercy and the god of destruction, I guess within ourselves, and including those as the two ends. 
I, uh, that sounds obscure, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I get that in some ways it's like the spirit in the body. Is that, I think is so. That accurate? Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of what I wanted to hear you talk about. The, that sense of the body. I, mean, I think you. Uh, Bob Creeley's uh, book Pieces, I think, is a really great act of meat science. You know, Bob, who. Uh, a, a lot of Bob's early poetry is. Uh, really thought poetry. Then he, Bob just inhabited his body for that time that he wrote pieces. And those, those are like very great and beautiful organic uh, pieces of a, of, of a great poem. Seems very natural to me. Then in another way, I think Francis Crick discovering the molecular or the atomic uh, structure of the DNA molecules, a great act of meat science, or a great elucidation of another aspect of it. The flame is ours. We are the candle that holds itself aloft. We are the Andes among creatures, and our hands are soft, and our cortex is a beacon, as are our toes. You and I are a river of light that pours and gleams in the blue-black snows. We are perfect as the tooth of a squirrel. How sweet, how sweet to be a rose by candle light or a worm by full moon. See the hopping flight a cricket makes. Nature loves the absence of mistakes. Here's a sort of medium longish poem. Uh, this is uh, six stanzas of six lines, and uh, it's called a uh, it's a medieval French uh, form called a sestina. It was invented by a troubadour poet named Bertrand de Born at the time of the Crusades, and probably the <clears throat> formula for the repetition of n-words, you'll, you'll hear that it, that it doesn't rhyme, but that there's a repetition of n-words in a pattern. And the formula for that pattern may have its origin in uh, uh, Mohammedan mysticism, the, the numerical formula for that. Remember the knights from Europe were confronting the knights of uh, the Muslim or the Mohammedan knights in North Africa and the Middle East, and there was a lot of communication back and forth. So this is a, this form of poetry was originally, uh, was invented by a, a duke of southern France who was also a troubadour, but the, this repetition of word, uh, this word repetition at the end may be influenced by uh, Mohammedan mysticism. And this uh, is adapted, uh, this, well, there's a story about this, too. I'll tell you what sparked this. <laughs> I'd always wanted to write a sestina. This kind of poem is called a sestina. And I was with Allen Ginsberg at uh, John Ashbery's reading at the San Francisco Museum of Art. John is a New York poet. And I just finished reading uh, uh, a book of John's poetry, and he read one of the poems, and it's a sestina about Popeye and olive oil and... What was the the sea witch and the goon? Remember all those characters from Popeye? Well, it was a it was a sestina about Popeye characters. And I was sitting next to Alan. And I said, Alan, that's a sestina. 
And by the time Ashbury had finished reading his Sestina, Alan had started his Sestina. And uh, I wanted to write one very badly after that myself. I mean, Ashbury had read one. Alan had written one on the spot. I'd been wanting to write a Sestina for years, but I'd been trying to write it rather formally in, in some kind of measured line. And I said, oh, I'm, I just want to do this. I'm not going to use a measured line. So I just used a, a, a cadenced line and wrote this. And since I sort of assigned myself the subject of a Sestina, at that time I had a chronic headache, and the headache became the subject of the Sestina. So it's a headache Sestina. But I was trying to also use it as a, almost as if it was a tool. I, I wanted to know what caused that headache. I wanted to experience that headache in any way I could. I, I thought that maybe in some way this would help me find out something about the headache. So I used the Sestina that way for exploration. Did you find out about your headache? Not through that Sestina. <laughs> maybe a little bit. Maybe it put me on the right track. The lines of flame, no, the, the beautiful lines of flame, that's it. You ever feel those lines of flame inside of your head when you have a headache? The beautiful lines of flame identify my headache. The fires are blue and gold and orange and turquoise. They ring like one beat of a drum within my skull. My being is overwhelmed by experience. Wings grow out of my skull to fly me away to soft moss where there is a cliff I would lie on among blossoms. Those things that are the world are white blossoms. They fall on the dark floor in the patterns of headache, creating a carpet in our being like moss. From a distance, the face becomes a mask of turquoise or jade, and it begins to reject the experience of anything, even gentleness, that touches the skull. I would speak with my body, but my skull is there like a crab shell decked with blossoms, and I wish to resist all but the drabbest experience, for I am lost and pounding the walls of my headache. It is a pleasure to run fingers over turquoise. The veins and striations may be felt as moss. The elegance of stones is like green moss growing on a jawbone dropped from a sheep skull on a cliff bank in Iceland where Indian turquoise is more exotic than these strange blossoms that make up a constellation I call my headache. The substrate suffers an overdose of experience. I take notes on the body of experience which grows as obsidian boulders and moss and becomes at last the statement of headache that vibrates minute beacons in my skull. Each being grows unique among blossoms of emanated gods and katydids in a field of turquoise. My house is electric blue, not turquoise, but I will imagine the bulks of all experience, for imagined or real, they are brother blossoms. I will not regret either needles or moss. Regardless of the noise in my skull, I will fall divinely in love with my headache. The night might be turquoise or a pale moss, but it is all experienced to be stored in the skull. This body is made of blossoms, even my headache. I don't know whether you could hear the repetitions in there or not, or the interweavings of word repetitions at the ends of lines. Matter of fact, I don't even believe you can hear me back there. Can you hear me? Each mammal does a small, perfect thing like to be himself or herself and to hold a new creation on a shining platter as he or she steps toward the waiting car. I better do that again. <coughs> the trouble with poems, you know, oh, I have to do it anyway again so it'll be <coughs> recorded for posterity. Um, with poems as they go by pretty fast, you know. And 
A, a lot of times it's good to hear a poem a second time. When you have the book in your hand, then you can keep going back to it. And also you can read them in any order you want. Each mammal does a small, perfect thing like to be himself or herself and to hold a new creation on a shining platter as he or she steps toward the waiting car. It's that area that Bob has so perfectly, you know, a, a little, a, an area of grace that we move through, a kind of dimension. Each mammal does a small, perfect thing like to be himself or herself and to hold a new creation on a shining platter as he or she step toward the waiting car. Is that dedicated to Bob? Yeah, that's called For Robert Creeley. <laughs> There's a lot of poems in here for people. Let's see. Here's a poem for uh, a friend of mine's wife who it makes stained glass windows, incredibly beautiful, naturalistic representations of uh, things in nature, of little water, of little streams with a snake swimming across them, or uh, seals floating through the water. Or this one was uh, this, the uh, chrysalis of an oak moth. Uh, the uh, actually the cocoon of an of an oak moth which, as you know, is only about this big. But she made a stained glass window of it in which it was this big. And so it's this enormous uh, representation of, of uh, an oak moth cocoon in, in, in all of its beauty with, like, the sky behind it and the twig that it hangs from is the size of a branch. And I just, I, I saw that. I already had two or three of her pieces, and I had to have it. So I bought that one from her, too. And then I couldn't stop there. I had to even write a poem about it for her, or which is kind of an occasional poem because now I see why I bought that chrysalis window. I am going to be somebody else and free with big, beautiful wings slowly beating on my brows. I am going to dive right out into all those colors, tastes, and smells. Nobody dragged me back. Everything like a mossy flag of dewy days and ogres kissing weird at the lips of caves, fairy tales of new transitions flashing by. <coughs> so the, I guess it's the challenge in something like that to change, to open up like a... Here's some more poems that I wrote in Peru. Uh, this was written, the, the first one I wrote about, uh, uh, the first one I read you, The Flame is Ours, We Are the Candle That Holds Itself Aloft, that was written in that past. This was written in a little Indian town way up in the mountains called uh, a, the town of Huancayo, written the next day. Study mind, body, to be beauty, to cancel misdirections is thy duty. The orange papaya heart is a law from which follows stars and planets, galaxies and moles, the goat kid on the banquet table, gravity waves and black holes. The bones are there and moved by muscles. The universe is where our spirit wrestles. This was written after coming back up uh, out of uh, a few days uh, in the Amazon jungle and uh, coming into Bogota and the difference of like 
being back in a modern city and looking back on what we'd seen. And I found a, a uh, physics text, uh, a Russian physics text translated into English full of quotes by Lenin. And I used a couple of lines, or I used a line of Lenin's to start this poem. The world consists of nothing but moving matter. When lives spread into the universe, they shatter rock and drink the juice as nutriment. The histories of beings whirl around each other in successions of cybernetic feedback, making models of complexity much simpler. Giant black toads of gentle love, trumpeter birds, with iridescent necks that peck around in mud-floored huts, a sleepy, square-faced jaguar chewing on a possum, and a margay kitten with nocturnal eyes. These are fragments of my being and song-like cries of the bulk of what I am as well as what I'm seeing. Where I am, the ancient ruins open lithic eyes and molecules again imagine that they are boudoirs high above the river chasm where crests of new hatched birds are trembling in the mountain breeze. It's looking back, remembering places like Machu Picchu and the jungle and the animals that we'd seen, uh, written in Bogota. The, the next day, or the same day, I guess, I can't remember, went into a restaurant and had that feeling of what Remember when you were in high school and you had to walk across the cafeteria? And you, oh, God, everybody's looking at me. <laughs> I had a total and you know, like self-involvement with self-consciousness in this perfectly wonderful restaurant. It was a great place to eat. And I just felt thrown back to that high school cafeteria, that whole experience again. Grown man, in control of my own ship of destiny, back up out of a long, exciting trip, and then suddenly back in the high school cafeteria again? <laughs> Why, you know? To be so sensitive, to want to run for it, and even fear to dash with head thrown back and everything a tremble while desires climb around like ogres in our chests and flash strange needs that lie upon the diaphragm as smothered fires, to think the business of the belly governs us when, in truth, we're smooth and free. Yes, we're lumps and bags of gurgling flesh and beauty, freedom, loveliness create the mesh that holds us to this surface. Cliffs in the dawn and shouts of laughter from the street, your jeweled hand upon the sheet. You know, these are very recent poems. It must be difficult to... Usually, you know, I didn't know I was going to give a poetry reading. I thought it was a, a discussion. Usually when I give a poetry reading, I try and make myself more three-dimensional for the people I'm reading to by reading poems from different eras in my life so that somebody can look at what I'm telling them and understand the direction that I'm that I'm coming from you know it, it may it would make me it would, my work would be much more three-dimensional for you if you could get some sense of that for instance here's a poem I wrote when I was 17 back in the Middle Ages uh, I, before this I'd written free verse too this is like a uh, this is when I discovered met, I discovered William Blake and I discovered metrics and I wanted to write in meter and I wanted to write poems like Blake's little youthful visionary song lyric poems. And uh, although I'd already written free verse, I wrote this. My mother said to me tonight that I am dead ten years and bending o'er my crib she bled a multitude of tears. And yet I think that isn't right. Oh, mother, you are wrong. Or round about my bed would stand four angels deep in song. 
For when the ground is white with frost, the angels fly and sing. But when the ground is wet with tears, the empty forests ring. Oh, mother, mother, laugh for me. The earth is black and damp. And sing a final song for me and light the final lamp. I, that, I recollect another one I wrote right about that time, only I had a little, been reading Baudelaire, too. I wrote another little set of quatrains. What strange odors in this room of spices, thyme, or bay? A roll of lace within the womb, it is the heart's decay. Deal the angels in this hand, the marguerites are dry, and at our side the seasons stand to stare with glassy eye. Don't think I ever recited that for anybody before. Not even sure that's right. I don't know where you were on that one. About 17. Yeah. But uh, just a few, a few years later, I. My uh, awarenesses in poetry were uh, directing themselves many different ways, multiple ways. And biology, interest in organisms, was making itself very strongly apparent to me and an interest in what was being done by the abstract expressionist painters, uh, Jackson Pollock or Clifford Still or Franz Klein. The work of those men, and it was pretty new in those days, was of a great deal of interest to me and I wanted to do something like that in poetry. And a little while later I discovered a man named uh, uh, Charles Olson who had invented a kind of projective verse which was close to what they were doing. But I, already I was experimenting in the direction that those painters that I considered to be artistic ideals in many ways uh, uh, were endeavoring in. And I was writing poems like uh, this you'd really need to hear a couple of times to see if I, see if I do know it. In fact, I, <clears throat> This would sound almost like an abstract poem, but if you could look at it on the page, uh, or maybe hear it again in a couple of days, I think it would, it would be a reasonably clear poem to you. Linked, linked, part to part, toe to knee, eye to thumb, motile, feral, a blockhouse of sweat, the smell of the hunts, a stench, my fetor, the eye, a bridegroom of torture. Colors are linked by spirit. Euglena, giraffe, frog, creatures of grace, rishi of their own right. As I walk, my legs say to me, run, there is joy and swiftness. As I speak, my tongue says to me, sing, there is joy in thought, and the size of the word is its own flight from crabbedness. And love is an ache. Oh, and the leaf is an ache. And love, an ache in the back. The stone, a creature. A palisade. The inside whitewashed. A pale tuft of grass. Gives you something to think about, doesn't it? <coughs> uh, I think that was the first time I'd seen the word Rishi used in a poem, as a matter of fact. Now we use the word Roshi, uh, a, a, Buddhist, uh, a Buddhist abbot or a Buddhist uh, teacher or a, a Buddhist wise man, as we now call a Roshi. The, uh, the word that I knew in those days for that was Rishi. And... Uh, some of the various elements in that poem uh, are biology, uh, fire sermon of Buddha, 
they're all, they're all submerged within the context. But they're things that I had in mind when I was writing it. That was probably written 1954. So these poems that I'm writing are are, are, are coming out of a development. David was saying, you know, it would be nice to, to say where your sense of being comes from. That's where it comes from. Hey, what kind of car is this skunk driving? Here's a poem I'd like to see as a song for Joan Baez. But I think the first line would be wrong for her, because the, the first line would sound mechanical as a, as a kind of, as in the context of uh, the kind of songs that she sings, where it isn't meant that way at all. Absorb all the beautiful systems to enhance our perfect freedoms. Enjoy the liberation of breath. Do not fear death. Love the children of dreams. We move in warm streams. We're cousins of eagle and deer, and the flesh that we wear is our dress. We are here. We are here. Absorb the beautiful systems. We move in warm streams. We're cousins of eagle and deer, and the flesh that we wear is our dress. Heartbeats in the ocean of stress. Love the children of dreams. Love the children of dreams. Absorb the beautiful systems. Then I was in I Magnets, and I'd been writing nature poems, and I thought, oh, could someone write a nature poem in I Magnets? Is I Magnets nature? <laughs> Somebody once uh, uh, Ask Nietzsche about what was uh, what was natural and unnatural, or what was nature and what wasn't nature. And uh, Nietzsche's uh, reply was something to the effect of, like, if it exists, it must be nature. So I found myself standing in I Magnon, uh, and I thought, could I write a nature poem about this? You know, from the viewpoint that one would write a nature poem, not the the not to go in and say. Uh, oh, uh, this is bad because it represents a military-industrial society, or uh, uh, this is foppery because it's fashionable clothing, but just like, okay, this is nature, I'm going to look at it, the way I'd look at a cliff or something. I don't know how well I succeeded, but this is an attempt to stand in, in, in I magnets as if you were standing by a waterfall. Yes, teach machines to whirl out snakeskin textiles of oil and milk, to sneak the, the living... I'm going to start this over again. Yes, teach machines to whirl out snakeskin textiles to sneak the living dollar from its slinky, silken resting place. The face of the well-dressed mannequin confronts you like your own. Now bones can be made of rods of chrome and plastic. This is the fantastic wealth of endless war, where petals falling to a floor that shines. I think I'll read uh, uh, one last poem, and then if anybody has any questions that have occurred to them, I can answer a couple of questions. Then it's up to David. 
It's going to go back to your hands. <coughs> this is a poem about Thornton Beach, a place that we like to go and uh, body surf uh, a, a mile or so south of San Francisco. How sweet we move in all the flowing melodies that shape our bodies to the icy tide. The lupin and the Indian paintbrush on the cliff are dripping with the fog. We laugh and body surf and slide upon the frozen silver waves. Fat arthropods are diving through the solid sand. Our skins turn blue and red. Awfully good. Yeah, it's a little difficult here with all this flat light. I think you have to have it for the for the uh, recording of this for the television. But. Yeah. Uh, you know what the what the flat light is? Somebody once said that uh, pop art is really... Uh, oh. Close your eyes. I'll have to have mine open to read it, though. <laughs> well, you know, I might have known it. This is really... Um, this, is just, this, poem, this is just a little a, a poem of appreciation of something that happens in my life, of a place where I can body surf, and, and you know, like the, the beauty of that place where... Indian paintbrush and lupin actually hang out of the cliff over the surf. You can body surf there, and when you come in, roll over in the, you know, in the wave and look up, and there's some lupin almost over your head. Lupin is that little blue flower that looks like a wild pea blossom on it. And you know what Indian paintbrush looks like. How sweet we move in all the flowing melodies that shape our bodies to the icy tide. The lupin and the Indian paintbrush on the cliff are dripping with the fog. We laugh and body surf and slide upon the frozen silver waves. Fat arthropods are diving through the solid sand. Our Skins turn blue and red. Arthropods are those little, you call them sand fleas, only I don't know what you call the big variety. Big sand fleas. Big sand fleas, gotcha. 